there while we're whispering. Welcome to our second panel on biosolutions. And in this panel, we have five speakers who will be discussing bio-based energy and materials. So I think this is a great opportunity to once again learn a lot. We're going to kick this one off with Ben Walker, who is the Technical Affairs Director for BTEC, which stands for the Biomass Thermal Energy. Thanks so much, Carol. Thanks to uh, EESI and the Sustainable Energy Coalition for uh, putting on this great event. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, really thermal energy and how it relates to biomass and really what policy um, can really help us with in terms of uh, making a dent in our um, greenhouse gas emissions and our carbon intensity through uh, use of this uh, important resource. So um, the, the main idea that I'd really uh, like to focus on is that, um, you know, we've, uh, in, in terms of American energy policy, we've tended to, very, um, to do very well at focusing on um, renewable, uh, uh, renewable sources for electricity, on re reducing emissions in our uh, transportation sector, um, sometimes um, to the point where uh, certain automakers have had uh, trouble um, perhaps complying with all the, um, the regulations. So, um, we, you know, we've done a really good job at that, but I think uh, one of the glaring errors are uh, areas where um, our policy landscape could improve is in the thermal energy sector, which uh, heating and cooling, uh, depending on the estimates you look at, uh, accounts for about 30 to 40 percent of our um, energy usage. and um, the Biomass Thermal Energy Council was formed in 2009 to really promote the use of biomass for uh, heating and combined heat and power uses uh, in uh, really addressing these needs and um, presenting a unified voice for uh, using biomass such as forest residuals, agricultural waste, and um, uh, a lot of different forms of, of woody and agricultural biomass that um, would otherwise uh, essentially go to waste and um, use up energy being being dealt with in that way. So um, <clears throat> we really see this as a great solution. Uh, we have about 90 members in our organization um, all across the United States, Canada, and Europe, um, representing uh, most of most of the of the American states. And um, uh, in terms of policy, some of the uh, things that I'd like to highlight. Uh, one of the initiatives that we're really excited to see taking root across, especially state policy, is uh, the idea of thermal renewable energy credits, uh, which have the awesome acronym T-REX. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, they, although hopefully they're not as scary, um, but they're very useful uh, not only for uh, accounting for renewable energy from biomass, but also from uh, solar energy, geothermal, and um, we really think that this is this goes uh, a long ways to addressing some of these policy imbalances in terms of only considering uh, electricity and transportation fuels as as areas that need to be uh, addressed. So uh, Massachusetts has recently drafted some regulations in their alternative portfolio standard dealing with uh, thermal metering and um, credits for these uh, for renewably produced uh, BTUs. Um, also, uh, New Hampshire has been doing this for a while, and there are, there are a handful of other states that have uh, started to implement this. Um, we're um, also uh, excited to see in the most recent um, House and Senate energy bills um, language allowing uh, federal agencies to uh, utilize thermal energy um, for their renewable energy uh, compliance goals. So uh, again, another, another way that we're seeing uh, the federal government uh, actually uh, being, a, being a leader in this. Um, we're, in terms of um, policy, we're also very happy to see um, the, uh, there's a House Biomass Caucus, um, which uh, uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers, who's speaking at today's forum, is, is one of the members of. And um, we have a number of strong supporters in the Senate, including uh, Senator Franken and uh, Senator King of, of Maine, um, who have uh, really been supportive of um, sort of leveling the playing field in terms of renewable energy. Um, tax credit structures. So um, I think all of us are fairly familiar with um, how 
renewable energy um, investment tax credits have really helped out uh, at key times with the solar and the wind industries. Um, this is uh, essentially legislation that would address, uh, that would provide a similar solution for a number of other uh, technologies that have not yet been, um, been given that treatment. So, um, and a couple of other things that, uh, that BTEC does as an organization that you might be interested in, uh, in knowing about. We're very big on um, really pushing, pushing the industry forward in terms of efficiency and sustainability through uh, codes and standards for, uh, for example, boiler efficiency, for um, grading different fuels, for uh, safe and uh, proper storage of pellet fuels, especially for uh, example for uh, developing a bulk delivery infrastructure for wood pellets uh, as they much as they have in Europe um, and so and we also are um, partnering with a lot of our um, regional regional networks of um, sustainability advocates of folks in the forestry and agricultural and university sectors um, and in industry who are working on um, better solutions for um, for integrating biomass energy and making sure that it's um, really a good uh, sustainable solution for us. And so, um, for example, there's a, a new uh, Yale University-led uh, Feasibility of Renewable Thermal Technology Initiative, uh, which includes technologies such as uh, geothermal heat pumps and solar thermal. Um, we also have the Pennsylvania Biomass Energy Association. Um, we have a working group in the Northeast called the Biomass Thermal Working Group uh, of the Northeast and uh, heat in the Midwest. So um, we really, um, for you know, folks who are in D.C., but also you know, all across the country, we're really um, seeing a lot of strides forward in, um, pr in producing more of our heat and cooling from um, biomass and even producing a little bit of power from that as well. So glad to uh, talk to you about that, and I hope you uh, have a chance to stop by our booth. Thank you. Thanks so much. <coughs> And I must say, we think that biomass is often so misunderstood. There are so there's so much information that we need to know about uh, biomass coming from all sorts of feedstocks, all sorts of plant matters, and it comes in many, many shapes and sizes all over the country. And uh, so this panel is a great way to start to learn much more about all of that. Uh, so we're now going to turn to Jennifer Jenkins, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer. Thank you. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about the practical sort of on the ground reality of sourcing biomass and making wood pellets. Um, I have four topics I want to talk to you about today. The first one, I'm going to talk a little bit about Inviva and our facilities and how we do business. I'll talk about our supply chain, sort of where we get our wood. Um, I want to set the stage for the Southeast US, which is where we source the majority of our wood and where we make our pellets. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we ensure sustainability. Um, so first, with Enviva and our facilities, we are the world's largest maker of wood pellets. Um, our, our facility, we have six facilities located in North Carolina, Virginia, Mississippi, and Florida. Um, and we, ha we ship out of a couple of different ports, from, uh, one from Port of Chesapeake near Norfolk, um, Port of Wilmington, Port of uh, Panama City in Florida. Um, we do export at this point, for now, 100% of our pellets. Um, mostly to customers in the EU, in, over in the European Union and, and in the United Kingdom. Um, in terms of our supply chain, um, the thing I want to emphasize, and this is sort of what, my, what, what Ben had mentioned as well, we, when you go in and when somebody harvests a forest, what they're really after are the big saw timber trees, the pretty ones, the ones without any crooks or, you know, um, eyes or any, you know, any, any defects, the ones that aren't, that aren't crooked or, or forked. Um, but as part of the harvesting process, you end up with a lot of other ones, the ones that aren't so good looking. And those are typically the pulpwood. They're smaller. Um, and the alternate fate for those trees is decay. They would either lie on the forest floor um, or, they, or they would go to the pulpwood and, and paper industry, which has a, has a short-term um, turnaround. 
Um, and so the wood that we take really is the lower quality. It's sort of the, it is the residues from forest harvest. It's the pulp quality trees. Um, it's not the saw timber trees. We can't, af we can't afford those trees. They're, they're too big. They're, they're, much more, uh, they're much more valuable. Um, in fact, on average, when we go into, a f you know, when we do take wood from a forest harvest, and we're never taking all of it, when we do take wood from a forest harvest, on average, we're taking about 37% of the, of the wood that comes off that stand. Um, and it accounts for less than 10% of the economic value that's received. So the saw timber trees are worth four to eight times as much. Um, as I said, we do work in the southeast U.S., so the, we take wood from the forests that are there. So um, for the most part, those are mixed oak pine stands. They are thinnings from southern yellow pine, um, sort of an intermediate treatment when you go in to improve the stand. You take out trees that you don't want, and then those are often the ones that we will take. Um, in terms of setting the stage for the southeast U.S., there's more... Um, Southeast U.S. is a great place to work. It's one of the world's biggest wood baskets. There is more forest there now than there was in, you know, at, in, after World War II um, in the last 50 years. There's even, in addition to there being more forest acreage, there's also more forest production. So roundwood production in the Southeast U.S. has increased um, it, in all categories, in the saw timber, hardwood, and softwood saw timber categories, as well as the hardwood and softwood pulp categories. 86% um, of the land base is privately owned, so we don't actually own our own forests. We do take wood from forests that the landowners um, are choosing to harvest. Often those forests are owned for their inheritance, they're sort of a family asset, and they're often used for revenue. Um, so it's a great place to do business. The, um, in terms of the three pillars of sustainability, um, we, we go beyond compliance in terms of the ensuring sustainability of the wood that we harvest. That's, as foresters, we, sustainability is our bread and butter, right? We don't have a forest resource if we don't maintain it and, and care for it appropriately. So, um, but in terms of how do we do that, the, the three pillars for us are we, our certification. Um, we maintain all of the appropriate sort of third-party certifications, if you're familiar with this industry, you know, certification is a key part of it. There are chain of custody um, and supply chain certifications that, that are available for businesses like ours, and we maintain them all. So um, SFI is one, Forest Stewardship Council is another, um, PEFC, which is a UK-based um, certification, we also maintain that for all of the wood that goes out of all of our ports. Um, we also, choose to purchase, whenever we can, wood that has been um, grown on a certified forest. Now, not much of the land base in the southeast U.S. is certified at all. Landowners find it's not worth their while often. They don't get a revenue out of it. So about less than 20 percent of the land base in the southeast U.S. is certified to any standard. Um, and so we do, whenever we can, source certified wood. We end up with about 15 percent of certified wood in our supply chain. Um, the second pillar of sustainability for Enviva is our care for the forest landscape. Um, we, as I said, believe strongly in sustainability and, and, and increased production and sustained production across the landscape. We also believe there are certain forests that should not be touched. They're just too precious and they're rare and they're too valuable. Um, and so for that, we have two things that we have done that ensure that the first thing we do is we ensure that we don't source wood from those, from those types of forests. And we've identified them and we have indicators of what they are so that we stay away from them. The second thing we've done is we have invested um, $500,000 a year for the next 10 years. So a total of $5 million in what we call the Enviva Forest Conservation Fund, which is a fund set aside for preservation of working forest landscapes. Um, and we do that because we believe that not only should we not harvest, we don't believe those forests should be harvested by us or by anyone, frankly. And so um, we have made the, the investment in the company-wide um, commitment to save those forests from, from harvest. Uh, the third pillar is transparency. So for every, every load of wood that comes across our scales, we know um, what its GPS coordinates were, who the owner is, um, you know, what kind of forest it was, um, where, you know, exactly, exactly where it came from, how old it was, um, you know, how much volume was sourced from that particular forest, how much of the volume we received. Um, so that's actually industry leading. I don't think you'll find any other company that is in business like ours that actually does that. Um, and we can, we can provide those data, um, and we will 
um, as soon as as soon as we, as soon as we can. We expect in the next few months to have something like that um, published online. So that is what we do. Hopefully, it gives you sort of an on the ground assessment of of what a business like ours looks like. Um, we're very proud of it. We provide wood pellets as a uh, substitute for coal in power plants as a renewable fuel, where it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Great. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And obviously, like, sustainability is key, and thanks for talking about that. Um, we're now going to turn to Chris Flyley, who is with Growth Energy, where he is the Director of Regulatory Affairs. Great. Thanks, Carol. Uh, and glad to be here. Thanks, you all, being here this morning. Um, Growth Energy, despite the name, we are actually the association of ethanol producers. Uh, we represent about 85 of the nation's 200 biorefineries, and we produce ethanol predominantly from corn. Um, despite what folks may think, this is not corn that you eat on corn on the cob. This is predominantly animal feed, and we literally take the starch out of the corn, produce fuel, and the, the rest, which are called distiller's grains, goes right back into the animal feed system. Um, it, you know, we talked about sustainability this morning. We are really in the transportation fuel business. Um, just out of curiosity for a little audience participation, who has fueled their car with ethanol? All right. Who drives a car? Just to, let's start there. Okay. Well, if you fueled within 100 miles of here, you put at least 10% ethanol in your car. Um, that's a little, I, I, I'm not sure many folks know that. Um, we as a nation use about 142 billion gallons of gasoline each year, and the ethanol industry represents about 10% of that. We are able to produce between 14 and 15 billion gallons. It's predominantly blended as E10, or 10, you see it as regular gasoline, but it's really a 10% ethanol blend. And why do we blend ethanol into our gasoline? Well, there, there's a couple different reasons. Most importantly, ethanol is an oxygenate. So you're getting octane, and it helps your fuel burn much more efficiently. It reduces particulate emissions. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Ethanol is about 34% on average better for greenhouse gases than gasoline. Um, it takes things like carbon monoxide, benzene, toluene, a lot of these are you know, known toxins or carcinogens out of the atmosphere. Um, and so you know, those are the sort of the consumer reasons you really want to blend with ethanol. Um, and part of this is, is what's happened here in Congress. About 10 years ago, Congress recognized the, the benefits. Well, Congress recognized several different things. At that point, we were importing about 60, 70 percent of our fuel from overseas, a lot from countries that we do not get along with very well, particularly in the Middle East. And so Congress, seeing a need, uh, implemented the renewable fuel standard. It called for, it, at that time, it called for 15 billion gallons of renewable fuel to be blended into our nation's fuel supply. It didn't, it, it, most of it was from ethanol, but also get into other fuels. Uh, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, Congress then revised it in 2007, adding a greenhouse gas reduction component to it. And so today's renewable fuel standard calls for 36 billion gallons by 2022. Um, we're in the process of going through the 2017 proposed rule now, uh, which EPA has set at 18.8 billion gallons of renewable fuel to be blended. It sounds like a lot, but when you talk about 142 billion gallons of gasoline and, what, 50 billion gallons of diesel, 50, 60, something like that, you're, you know, we're really a small part. You know, we've got a nation's transportation system, which has been built for 100 years purely on, on oil. Um, you know, when you guys go to fill up your pump, you've basically got three choices at best. You know, it's regular, mid-grade, or premium. We're trying to change that. We're trying to give you lots of opportunities to, you know, as a consumer, you can go to the store and buy, I can buy Dasani water, I can buy Poland Spring water, I can buy big ones, small ones. When you go to the gas pump, you, like I said, you've got three choices at best. We want to give you the opportunity to fuel up with higher ethanol blends, E85, even further reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, either further particulate reductions. E15 is being introduced in the market today. E15 can be used in any vehicle that's 2001 or newer. 
Um, you're seeing it at places like Sheets, particularly in North Carolina. Racetrack just agreed to put it in 100 stores, come and go. Um, you know, and it's selling for between five and ten cents less. Who doesn't want like, who doesn't want to buy cheaper gasoline that's better for the environment? I mean, it's a no-brainer. The problem is is access, and that's really what the renewable fuel standard does for us. A lot of people complain that it's a mandate, but we've got a few, we've got a transportation fuel system that's been built solely on oil, and you can't just unlike you know, buying water, you can't just go and put it in the store. You've got to have access to the marketplace. And right now, when you see Exxon or BP above a station, you better believe they control what fuel goes into those, those stations. They may not own the station, but they certainly control what's available. Um, and so we're at, the, we're at the precipice of changing that. The renewable fuel standard basically looks like this and calls for higher volumes. But the only way to get that to work is to have these higher ethanol blends in, or higher biofuel blends into place. Um, and we're seeing that today. As I said, we're, you know, we've got major retailers who are now offering these transportation fuels. We think it's a win-win for consumers. It's a win-win for the retailers. And really, it's a win-win for our nation. You're getting substantial environmental benefits. You're getting economic benefits. Ethanol is produced here domestically. You know, we support nearly 400,000 U.S. jobs, nearly 40, 45 billion dollars to the economy, um, and you know we're having to re we're having to import less crude oil from uh, you know overseas. Um, so ultimately, we think this is a real solution for our transportation fuel system. Um, you know, I, I think the other piece that we talk about as well is there's been a big, big focus on reducing. <clears throat> I'm sorry, improving gas mileage, fuel mileage for cars. Um, as I mentioned earlier, ethanol is a high octane fuel. So as car builders go to smaller, more higher efficient engines, they need higher octane fuels. Well, nobody wants to buy an expensive premium to put in their new car. Ethanol, if you blend at say a 30% ethanol rate, you're actually getting a fuel that's cheaper than regular gasoline and at a premium octane level, like a 92 octane. So again, it, it, it's a, we think you know ethanol is a winner. We think biofuels are a winner. I, we think they help all the goals that we're talking about today. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over. Thanks. Great, thank you. So we're now going to look at another very important biofuel. And to hear about that, we will turn to Ben Evans, who is the Director of Public Affairs with the National Biodiesel Board. Uh, well, thanks, Carol. And uh, thanks to the uh, Coalition for putting on another great expo this year um, and for giving us a chance to talk about biodiesel. Uh, and the role that it's playing in the uh, nation's uh, energy mix. Um, again, my name is Ben Evans. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the National Biodiesel Board. Uh, we represent biodiesel and renewable diesel, which is a similar uh, renewable fuel uh, diesel replacement. It's made using a slightly different technology from, uh, from biodiesel. Um, we have about 200 members across the country. We represent fuel producers, uh, fuel distributors, feedstock suppliers, and others. Um, there are biodiesel and renewable diesel plants in almost every state in the country, uh, from, from California to Iowa to Rhode Island, and they're making fuel um, from a wide variety of, of feedstocks. Biodiesel can be made from any kind of fat or oil. Uh, the leading feedstocks in the U.S. are uh, plant oils like, like soybean oil, uh, recycled cooking oil, um, animal fats, rendered animal fats, uh, and the diversity in those feedstocks is actually a real benefit. Uh, for the industry and, and for the markets. Um, last year, uh, the biodiesel and renewable diesel industry supported about uh, almost 50,000 jobs across the country. Um, so obviously ethanol uh, sort of dominates the conversation in, in Washington over renewable fuels. I think that's understandable given that it's by far the largest renewable fuel at about 15 billion gallons. Um, but we, we think that the, that the biodiesel story is really a, another sort of remarkable success story in the renewable fuel space that, uh, that doesn't get a lot of attention, so I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk about it. Um, so uh, if you look back 10 years, biodiesel was really uh, sort of an, a niche industry. We, 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 you had some co-ops and small companies producing biodiesel. Uh, we did about 25 million gallons in 2005. Um, so fast forward, to last year, 
uh, and American consumers used uh, almost 2.1 billion gallons of biodiesel in 2015. Uh, that's 2.1 billion gallons um, out of a diesel market of about, the on-road diesel market is about 40 billion gallons. Um, the overall, if you take into account all industrial uses, everything is about 60. Um, so uh, clearly, the industry has, has grown a tremendous amount over the past decade, and that's really a testament to uh, policies like the renewable fuel standard um, and the biodiesel tax incentive that are uh, stimulating investment and, and growth uh, and hiring uh, in the industry around the country. Um, we're now to a point where a lot of the truck stops uh, around the country are selling biodiesel blends of 10, 15, maybe 20%. Uh, um, you have fleets, corporate fleets, uh, school bus fleets, um, you know, uh, utilities and municipalities are turning to biodiesel to, to reduce the carbon footprint of their uh, buses and trucks. Um, and if you drive a diesel vehicle uh, and you go buy diesel fuel uh, in the United States, you're likely getting up to 5% biodiesel uh, uh, at times, uh, without even knowing it, biodiesel up to 5% meets the same technical specification as, as, as petroleum diesel, uh, doesn't even require labeling. And, and that's an important point, biodiesel uh, doesn't require any sort of modification to your engine. Uh, it, it can be used in existing diesel engines to, as they are today. Um, so I think one of, the, one of the things we're most proud of is the role that, that biodiesel is playing in, in, uh, in delivering advanced biofuels to uh, consumers, there's, there's a lot of talk about advanced biofuels not happening as quickly as folks had hoped. Um, certainly cellulosic has been, uh, cellulosic ethanol has been a little slower to develop uh, than, than was anticipated. Um, but uh, biodiesel is, is proving that we can develop advanced biofuels on a commercial scale nationwide uh, in an economical way and deliver it to American consumers with real huge reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So what does that mean? What is an advanced biofuel? Um, a lot of people throw that term around in different ways, but we like to stick with the, uh, with the EPA's definition, which is that an advanced biofuel uh, reduces greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% compared to petroleum diesel, or the petroleum counterpart baseline fuel. Um, so in its, in its analysis for the RFS, uh, the EPA found that biodiesel reduces greenhouse gas emissions by at least 57% uh, and as much as 86% compared with uh, petroleum diesel. Um, and that's including everything, all the energy inputs that go into making the fuel, the, in, any indirect impacts, uh, the tailpipe pollution. Uh, it's really the whole shoot and match. Uh, it's 57 to 86%. Uh, the California Air Resources Board in developing the low carbon fuel standard recently uh, came up with a similar result of 50% of reduction to 81% reduction, again, depending on which feedstock is used to make the fuel. Um, so, you know, I want to repeat that. Every gallon of biodiesel that we use instead of petroleum diesel is reducing gr greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% and as much as 86%. Um, and that is a tremendous reduction. There's not a, a fuel on the planet that delivers that level of a, of a carbon reduction, um, at least it's, you know, in commercial scale production on a widespread uh, uh, level nationwide. Um, and, and so we're, we're, uh, we're very proud of that. Um, biodiesel, in fact, is, is, the, is the first, and it's, it's so far the only advanced biofuel that's designated as such by the EPA with, with commercial scale production. Um, on a, on a nationwide uh, basis. Um, so, and I think that's particularly important, and Chris, Chris got to this a little bit. Um, the, the transportation sector accounts for more than a quarter of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there's a lot of talk with the clean power plan about the utility sector. Uh, that's about 30% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. But transportation is second uh, in, in terms of the sectors at 26%. So clearly, if we're going to do something about greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the United States, we have to do more with finding alternatives to petroleum. Um, and the RFS is doing that. Uh, you know, I think everybody hope, wants things to change overnight. Nothing's gonna change overnight, but we're making real progress with the RFS in displacing petroleum. Um, and we can continue doing that with, with, uh, with, with, with smart policy uh, moving forward. So uh, I think with that, Carol, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Thanks. our final speaker on this panel is Claude Conduser, who is the CEO and General Counsel for Plant Oil Powered Diesel, or PUFF. Claude? Thank you, Carol. 
I'd also like to thank our hosts, the Energy, the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, the Sustainable Energy Coalition, and the United States Senate and House of Representatives Renewable Fuel and Energy Efficiency Caucuses. Plant Oil Powered, or POP Diesel, is the first company in 2013 to win US EPA approval to sell 100% ordinary plant oil as fuel to power diesel engines. When I say plant oil, I'm speaking basically of vegetable oil like the stuff you buy at the grocery store. The engines have to have our uh, special EPA approved and patented auxiliary fuel system installed on them, which doesn't change the engine at all. It's just a secondary fuel tank to hold the plant oil. Uh, but other than the brief startup and shutdown period on petroleum diesel, the engine runs on 100% ordinary plant oil. This fuel is better performing than petroleum diesel in the engine. Pop diesel will be able to sell it for 50 cents a gallon less than petroleum diesel, even at the lowest prices that petroleum reached uh, in the last year. And that takes into account the use of 10% additional plant oil fuel to power the compression ignition or diesel engine because of the fact that it has slightly lower energy content. Still 50 cents a gallon in real cost savings to the trucking customer. And with our equipment installed, the engine runs on 100% plant oil. Uh, Pop Diesel has gotten approval from the EPA for a specific kind of plant oil from the Hetropha tree whose fruit and seeds are inedible and therefore don't compete with the food supply if they're used to make biofuel. And um, let me just s distinguish a little bit between Hetropha plant oil fuel and biodiesel because we're, we're commonly confused, our fuel is commonly confused with biodiesel. Biodiesel starts out as, uh, as plant oil, the molecule pictured on your left. And then it undergoes a very energy intensive and costly transformation, which actually restructures the molecule into something else, which is called biodiesel. Then the biodiesel is restricted by nationwide standards adopted by the petroleum industry to being blended for on-road use in only a 5% concentration. So when you hear of biodiesel being used by a municipality or a trucking fleet, typically it's gonna be 5% biodiesel and 95% petroleum diesel. Uh, there are some engines that can run on as much as 20% biodiesel, but then it's still 80% petroleum diesel. Uh, studies done by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, a, a survey conducted and commissioned by EPA, conducted for EPA, found that when you take the ordinary plant oil and you process it into biodiesel, you basically double the amount of energy that's invested in the fuel. Uh, the European Union, uh, the EPA made its finding that uh, Ben spoke about concerning biodiesels uh, providing 50% reduction um, in greenhouse gas emissions. I think it was in 2008. The European Union did a revisit of that issue in the last year and found that basically biodiesel, uh, when you process the plant oil into the biodiesel, you produce more overall greenhouse gas emissions not just out the tailpipe, but in the manufacture, et cetera, of the fuel, you end up with between 1.3 and three times more overall greenhouse gas emissions put into the atmosphere uh, than if you just left the plant oil in its ordinary state. So uh, because we pop diesel does not further process the plant oil into biodiesel, we can sell the fuel for the low price that I mentioned, 50 cents a gallon below the price of petroleum diesel. Let me speak to you a little bit about our method of growing Hetropha. Uh, Hetropha tree grows in all of the non-arid tropical areas of the world. Pop diesel works only in non-forested areas, savanna land, that does not have trees on it, or at least forest land. Uh, it's not forest land. We partner with small-scale farmers. They grow the trees on their own land. For every acre of Hetropha trees that a farmer plants in partnership with Pop Diesel, we support the farmer to grow between one and three acres of food crops. Some opponents of biofuels say that there's a choice between 
using land for, to make biofuels or to grow food crops. And this is simply not true if you're growing in areas that are savanna land that are not forested. And there are vast expanses of the tropical world uh, in Africa, Asia, and South America that are not forested and that are not being used or that are agricultural land or past agricultural land that's lying fallow where farmers can grow both heterotrophy trees and food crops. When pop diesel supports a farmer to grow food crops, the farmer gets a yield of the food crop between two and five times more than if the farmer were growing it on his or her own. So we don't think there's a, a, a choice between heterotrophy by the method that pop diesel has adopted on growing the trees on non-forested savanna land and supporting the local farmers to grow food crops as well. Um, the heterotrophy tree is a remarkable tree in some respects. Well, first of all, let me just say that it, we believe that it's nature's best carbon sequestration device because it produces the highest yield of oil per acre of any tree or crop other than palm oil trees. And palm oil, of course, is a food product. So if it's used to make biodiesel or some other biofuel, then you're diverting that supply away from the, the food commodity. Um, in addition, palm trees extend their roots shallow and wide, and they tend to extract nutrients out of the topsoil. And that's created a lot of problems for the image of biofuels in developing countries because palm trees do uh, take the, diminish the quality of the soil. In contrast, the heterotrophy tree, uh, it's a softwood tree and ex it extends its roots deep. And they take minerals and other nutrients from below the topsoil and bring them to the surface. And when the the fruit and the leaves and the branches decompose when they fall to the earth and decompose, you contribute those additional min uh, minerals and other nutrients back to the soil. So heterotrophy trees actually enrich the soil and leave it better uh, for later on. I've seen land that was completely cleared of topsoil. Heterotrophy trees were planted on this barren land and were allowed to grow. The fruits, leaves, and trees fell to the ground and decomposed. And also the heterotrophy has a very high nitrogen content, so when that decomposes, it enrich further enriches the soil. Four or five years later, the heterotrophy trees were cut down, and you had very rich, dark uh, topsoil with lots of earthworms in it, ideal for growing additional crops. So with, with that in mind, uh, Pop Diesel has the idea that if we take an area the size of the Amazon rainforest, and we planted that in West Africa, half in heterotrophy trees and half in food crops, then we could supply all of the petroleum diesel needs of the United States, both on-road and off-road. In addition, we would generate enough food crops to feed 1.5 billion people. This is entirely feasible to do. Uh, this book, which is titled Collapse, how Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed by Pulitzer Prize winning author Jared Diamond in its chapter nine explains that the country of Japan was on its way to becoming denuded of trees several centuries ago. The leaders got together, made a conscious decision to reforest and today Japan is one of the most highly forested countries in the world as being, as well as being one of the most highly uh, intensely populated with the highest population density within the industrial world. So this has been done already in Japan and with the heterotrophy tree we can do this in areas of, of the world that are presently not forested. And when uh, pop diesel will be planting by 2018, 45 million heterotrophy trees in a concentrated area of 30,000 acres in partnership with small scale farmers in West Africa. And when you plant that many trees in an area, the trees transpire, they give moisture back to the atmosphere. And if this is done in a systemic way, then indeed you can begin to add more moisture to the atmosphere uh, and ultimately uh, reverse the, the uh, desertification that is occurring uh, from North Africa spreading down up to the uh, Atlantic coast and, uh, and change the, the climate there and produce more moisture as well as I said, producing enough 
potentially hydrofa plant oil to uh, supply America's needs and additional food crops. Briefly, on policy matters, uh, pop diesel um, uh, is not allowed to sell our products to the U.S. market. Although we've proven to EPA that uh, the emissions from hydrofa plant oil are no worse than petroleum diesel, EPA's greenhouse gas regulations are not based on life cycle emissions. They look oddly only at tailpipe emissions. And because of the particular structure of the plant oil molecule, uh, plant oil produces higher tailpipe emissions but has much lower overall net life cycle emissions. But because uh, EPA in its, in its regulations of which engines can be sold to the U.S. market looks only at tailpipe emissions, unless EPA adopts revised uh, regulations which they are supposed to be announcing next month, we will not be able to sell these engines to the U.S. market. One last point, I know my time Your is time expiring. Is up. Your okay. time is, up. is that the EPA regulations on which hydrofa plant oil can come into the U.S. are overly restrictive because they prevent essentially this kind of oil from coming from Africa and Asia because those countries didn't keep paper records of what the land was used for back in 2007. So as a result, Pop Diesel uh, believes that the renewable fuel standard in the hands of a government agency is really not the way to go, and we would support adoption of a uh, fossil fuel tax um, and elimination of specialized credits and subsidies that are presently awarded to certain kinds of fuels and, and technologies, not only in the f motor fuel area, but uh, in other areas as well, wind, solar, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Claude. Um, we are running a little short on time, but I just wanted to mention that here again, it's an example of how there are so many different kinds of feedstocks appropriate in different places that can make such a difference. And obviously, uh, we should remember that our transportation sector, as, as you've heard, is so dependent upon petroleum. And we now have more um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from petroleum in this country than we do from coal. So it's just important to keep all of that in perspective. And sure. I think there was a clarification yeah, can I just that address they wanted a, to make. Clarify a couple right. of things. You talked about 20 percent, 5 percent. Biodiesel. The vast majority of vehicles and is, is sold in the United States uh, support 20 percent blends of biodiesel. Um, there's a few brands that don't. Uh, the vast majority do. The state of Illinois has had a, uh, a tax incentive for 11 percent uh, biodiesel for five years. Uh, every, almost every vehicle in the state of Illinois runs on 11 percent biodiesel if it's a diesel vehicle. Um, so that's, there was a little misinformation there about the 5 percent limit. Uh, and then uh, you mentioned the EU study. I, there's all sorts of studies about renewable fuels. I think we all, we all know that about the emissions of biomass and renewable fuels. But the, the EPA analysis was in 2010, um, and the California Air Resources Board was just last year when they analyzed biodiesel and found the 50 to 81 percent. Great. And I don't think anybody would argue that CARB is a, a regulatory pushover. No, that, that is uh, uh, for sure, and that they have been moving forward on all sorts of uh, greenhouse emission standards and also a low carbon fuel standard as well. So I want to thank all of our panelists. And if you've got questions, you know, please see them like out in the hall. And um, we look forward to having our next panel uh, prepare and come up. Thank you very much. <laughs>